Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer on this Wednesday of Easter 7, uh, May the 27th. I apologize for not having morning prayer this morning. Uh, we had some other things we had to do and I just completely forgot about it until it was way, way past time. So I apologize for that. Uh, we will back up though in the morning. I will do this morning's reading along with tomorrow morning's reading because that's still the continuation of Korah's Rebellion and you do want to hear that entire story. It's three parts. It's one of the more important uh, stories you read in the Book of Numbers. So we'll put all that together tomorrow uh, and uh, see where we go with it. Okay, let's begin uh, this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts, and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Our New Testament reading today is from Luke's Gospel, Luke 19, the account of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When Jesus drew near to Bethpage in Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he knew, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. As he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is the last part of the Apostles' Creed, Article 3, and then tomorrow evening we will begin the Lord's Prayer. 
So we're going to back up to the last paragraph we finished with yesterday. And he was talking about the phrase, the, the communion of saints, a congregation of saints, a holy congregation. And then he continues, but this is the meaning and substance of this edition. I believe that there is upon earth a little holy group and congregation of pure saints, under one head, even Christ. Ephesians 1.22 this group is called together by the Holy Spirit in one faith, one mind and understanding, with many different gifts, yet agreeing in love, without sects or schisms. Ephesians 4, 5 to 8 and 11. I am also a part and member of this same group, a sharer and joint owner of all the goods it possesses, Romans 8, 17. I am brought to it and incorporated into it by the Holy Spirit through having heard and continuing to hear God's word, Gal Galatians 3, 1 to 2, which is the beginning of entering it. In the past, before we had attained to this, we were altogether of the devil, knowing nothing about God and about Christ, Romans 3, 10 to 12. So until the last day, the Holy Spirit abides with the Holy Congregation, or Christendom, John 14, 7. Through this congregation, he brings us to Christ, and he teaches and preaches to us the word, John 14, 26. By the word, he works and promotes sanctification, causing this congregation daily to grow and to become strong in the faith, and its fruit which he produces, Galatians 5. We further believe that in this Christian church we have forgiveness of sin, which is wrought through the holy sacraments and absolution, Matthew 26, 28, Mark 1, 4, and John 20, 23. And through all kinds of comforting promises from the entire gospel. Therefore, whatever ought to be preached about the sacraments belongs here. In short, the whole gospel and all the offices of Christianity belong here which also must be preached and taught without ceasing. God's grace is secured through Christ, John 1.17, and sanctification is wrought by the Holy Spirit through God's word in the unity of the Christian church. Yet because of our flesh, which we bear about with us, we are never without sin, Romans 7.23-24. Everything, therefore, in the Christian church is ordered toward this goal. We shall daily receive in the church nothing but the forgiveness of sin through the word and the signs, to comfort and encourage our consciences as long as we live here. So, even though we have sins, the grace of the Holy Spirit does not allow them to harm us. For we are in the Christian church, where there is nothing but continuous, uninterrupted forgiveness of sin. This is because, because God forgives us, and because we forgive, bear with, and help one another. Galatians 6, 1-2 But outside of this Christian church, where the gospel is not found, there is no forgiveness, as also there can be no holiness. Therefore, all who seek and wish to learn holiness, not through the gospel and forgiveness of sin, but by their works, have expelled and severed themselves from this church. Galatians 5.4 However, while sanctification has begun and is growing daily, 2 Thessalonians 1.3, we expect that our flesh will be destroyed and buried with all its uncleanness, Romans 6.4-11. Then we will come forth gloriously and arise in a new eternal life of entire and perfect holiness. For now we are only half pure and holy. So the Holy Spirit always has some reason to continue his work in us through the word. He must daily administer forgiveness until we reach the life to come. At that time there will be no more forgiveness, but only perfectly pure and holy people. 1 Corinthians 13.10 we will be full of godliness and righteousness, removed and free from sin, death, and all evil, in a new, immortal, and glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15, 43 and 53. You see, all this is the Holy Spirit's office and work. He begins and daily increases holiness upon earth through these two things, the Christian church and the forgiveness of sin. But in our death, he will accomplish it altogether in an instant. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and will forever preserve us therein by the last two parts of the creed. But the term resurrection of the flesh used here does not agree with good German wording. For when we Germans hear the word flesh, fleisch, we think of nothing more than a butcher block. But in good German wording, we would say resurrection of the body. However, it is not a big issue as long as we understand the words right. Now this is the article of the creed that must always be and remain in use, for we have already received creation. Redemption, too, is finished. But the Holy Spirit carries on his work without ceasing to the last day. 
For that purpose he has appointed a congregation upon earth by which he speaks and does everything. For he has not yet brought together all his Christian church, Christenheit, John 10, 16, or granted all forgiveness. Therefore we believe in him who daily brings us into the fellowship of this Christian church through the word. Through the same word and the forgiveness of sins, he bestows, increases, and strengthens faith. So when he has done it all, and we abide in this, and die to the world and to all evil, he may finally make us perfectly and forever holy. Even now we expect this in faith through the word. See, here you have the entire divine essence, will, and work shown most completely in quite short and yet rich words. In these words all our wisdom stands, which surpasses and exceeds the wisdom, mind, and reason of all people. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25 the whole world, with all diligence, has struggled to figure out what God is, what he has in mind and does, yet the world has never been able to grasp the knowledge and understanding of any of these things. But here we have everything in richest measure. For here in all three articles, God has revealed himself and opened the deepest abyss of his fatherly heart and his pure, inexpressible love. Ephesians three eighteen and 19. He has created us for this very reason, that he might redeem and sanctify us. In addition to giving and imparting to us everything in heaven and upon earth, he has even given to his Son and the Holy Spirit, who brings us to himself, Romans 8, 14 and 32. For, as explained above, we could never grasp the knowledge of the Father's grace and favor except through the Lord Christ. Jesus is a mirror of the fatherly heart, John 14, 9. Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews 1.3, outside of whom we see nothing but an angry and terrible judge. But we couldn't know anything about Christ either unless it had been revealed by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2.12. These articles of the Creed, therefore, divide and separate us, us Christians, from all other people on earth. Even if, or even if we were to concede that, all people outside Christianity whether heathen, Turks, Jews, or false Christians and hypocrites, believe in and worship only one true God, they still do not know what his mind toward them is and cannot expect any love or blessing from him. And I'm going to stop right there uh, because this is the infamous uh, article, uh, part two, paragraph 66, uh, that caused like, quite a bit of controversy in the church. Uh, we'll read it again because when you don't have it in front of you, it's hard to catch. But it, Luther is talking about these articles of the Creed separating us from everybody else who's not a Christian. And Luther says, even if we were to concede that all people outside Christianity, whether heathen, Turks, Islam, Jews, or false Christians and hypocrites, believe in and worship only one true God, they still do not know what his mind toward them is. But he says, even if we were to concede that they worship the same God we do, he is not saying that they do. Uh, he's saying nothing of the sort. He's saying that they do not uh, believe in the same God we believe in. So uh, Muslims, even Jews, we do not worship the same God. Uh, Mormons, we do not worship, worship the same God. Jehovah's Witnesses, we do not worship the same God. Uh, so Luther was very clear, uh, but... In the translation from the German to English, it can get a little muddled and it can look like he is saying, ah, but we do, you know, if we concede that, they worship the same God we do. He says, if, not that we are. Uh, so it's enough ranting about that, but there's entire books written about just this paragraph because of the trouble it's caused. Uh, so Luther was saying nothing of the sort. Uh, we believe in the one true triune God. Now, I don't remember where we left off at. Uh... Uh, we, they still do not know his mind toward them and cannot expect any love or blessing from him. Therefore they, meaning unbelievers, in eternal wrath, abide in eternal wrath and damnation, for they do not have the Lord Christ, and besides are not illumined and favored by any gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 9-16, and Hebrews 6, 4-6. From this you see that the creed is a doctrine quite different from the Ten Commandments, for the commandments teach what we ought to do, but the creed tells us what God does for us and has given to us. Furthermore, apart from this, the Ten Commandments are written in all people's hearts, Romans 2.15. However, no human wisdom can understand the creed. It must be taught by the Holy Spirit alone, 1 Corinthians 2.12. 
The teaching of the commandments therefore makes no Christian, for God's wrath and displeasure abide upon us still, because we cannot keep what God demands of us. But the creed brings pure grace and makes us godly and acceptable to God. For by this knowledge we have love and delight in all God's commandments. Romans 7.22 Here we see that God gives himself to us completely. He gives all that he has and is able to do in order to aid and direct us in keeping the Ten Commandments. The Father gives all creatures, the Son gives his entire work, and the Holy Spirit bestows all his gifts. Let this be enough about the creed to lay a foundation for the simple, so that they may not be burdened. Then, if they understand the substance of it, they themselves may afterwards strive to gain more, refer to these parts, whatever they learn in the scriptures, and may ever grow and increase in richer understanding. Ephesians 4, 14-15, and 2 Peter 3, 14. For as long as we live here, we shall daily have enough to do to preach and to learn this. And that is the end of the Apostles' Creed. So tomorrow we will begin with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is divided into nine petitions. And how is it again? So the second petition, it's a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Okay. The introduction, we will probably do the introduction to the Lord's Prayer in two parts. And then we'll begin with the first petition. So tomorrow's Thursday. Thursday and Friday, the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. Monday, we'll begin with the first petition because some of these, the petitions themselves are short. The introduction, Luther writes, is long. And that'll be enough about that for this evening. Now we'll join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our Wednesday prayer is the shorter litany. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord, to comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. O King, who comes in the name of the Lord, through your birth and death, earth and heaven were joined together in peace. May your coming as King into Jerusalem in humility on the donkey help us to see that you continue to come as our King, hidden in humble water, humble words, and humble food. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, your mercy attends us all our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world, and at life's end, grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Good night.